Good afternoon and a very, very warm welcome to Great Sacred Music today. Our theme for today is Gaelic hymns. Prayer and spirituality with roots in Gaelic and more generally Celtic traditions have enjoyed a great surge of popularity in the last 30 years or so. Some of them are rooted deep into tradition with prayers and texts like the one we've just heard sung that have been around for centuries whilst others are a more modern take on what might sometimes be imagined as a Celtic past. Either way, this form of spirituality resonates deeply today, maybe because of its constant links to nature and the natural world and its beauty, and a deeply embodied physical quality rooted in simplicity and relationships. And, and in that way, Celtic liturgies and spirituality tend to answer some of the longings of modern life in complex and technologically advanced societies. Our opening piece was a prayer of St. Patrick by John Rutter. Rutter was born in London in 45, 1945 and studied music at Clare College, Cambridge. His compositions embraced choral, orchestral and instrumental music and he's edited various choral anthologies. He has been director of music at Clare College and in 1981 formed his own choir, the Cambridge Singers. He now divides his time between composition and conducting and he's a highly sought after, he's a highly thought, sought after as a guest conductor for the world's leading choirs and orchestras. But as prayer of St. Patrick is a setting of words from the sixth century prayer, St. Patrick's Breastplate or the Lorica of St. Patrick. In the Irish monastic tradition, a lorica is a prayer that you recite for protection. This specific prayer combines an invocation of Christ's presence with the immediacy and physicality of that presence behind and before, around and all around. It's an invocation for the presence of Christ, maybe particularly at times when that presence feels most elusive. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ above me, Christ beneath me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. It's our tradition at Great Sacred Music to begin by singing a hymn together. And our hymn will be, Be Thou My Vision. This is an 8th century Irish hymn, often attributed to St. Dallin in the 6th century. The text of Be Thou My Vision reflects aspects of life in early Christian Ireland. The prayer, just like St. Patrick's breastplate, is a lorica, a prayer for protection. There's a symbolic use of a battle shield on a sword to invoke the protection and power of God. And he draws on St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, which refers to the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. This kind of um, military symbolism was common in the poetry and hymnology of Christian monasteries of the period due to the prevalence of clan warfare across Ireland. The poem refers to God as king of the seven heavens and the high king of heaven. And this kind of depiction of the Lord God of heaven on earth as chieftain or high king is a traditional representation in Irish literature. You also find it in medieval Irish poetry, which typically used that heroic imagery to cast God as a clan protector. The tune we use, Slain, is named after a hill in County Meath in Ireland where St. Patrick lit an Easter fire in an act of defiance against the, against the pagan king. And this eventually led to his unlimited freedom to preach the gospel in Ireland. So we remain seated as the voices stand and lead, be thou in my vision. <laughs>
we will next hear two pieces from Ina Boyle's Gaelic hymns composed in 1923 and 24. They are Gaelic hymns and invocations collected in the Hebrides and Western Highlands of Scotland and translated by Alexander Carmichael. Ina Boyd was a 20th century Irish composer. She lived quietly with her family in County Wicklow and from 1923 she regularly crossed the Irish Sea by steamship for lessons with the prolific British composer Vaughan Williams who thought very highly of his Irish student. Despite his encouragement, Boyle refused to relocate to London and instead lived all of her life in the family home, caring for her parents and sister who needed her. Performances of her work were well received, but rather infrequent. She gained some benefit from her involvement with a group of other young female composers, including Elizabeth Lutyens, Elizabeth McConchy, and Grace Williams who organized a concert series as performance opportunity. Unfortunately, with the outbreak of the Second World War, Boyle had to stop her travels and that cut her off from musical opportunities in London. She continued to compose throughout her life and never ceased to promote her music by sending scores to conductors and choir directors. She lived in lifelong seclusion in rural County Wicklow and took inspiration from the stunning landscape around her family home. She carried on writing to her mentor, Bone Williams, and he once wrote back to her, I think it is most courageous of you to go on with such little recognition. The only thing to say is that it does come, finally. <laughs> Thank you. 
Our next two pieces will be from British composer Charles Villiers Stanford's six Irish folk songs with text by the Irish writer, poet and lyricist Thomas More. First, we'll have At the Mid-Hour of the Night from volume five, and it is not the tear from one, one of his famous Irish melodies. Stanford was an Anglo-Irish composer, music teacher and conductor of the late Romantic era. He studied at Cambridge, Leipzig, and Berlin. While still an undergraduate, Stanford was appointed as organist of Trinity College, Cambridge. In 1882, aged just 29, he was one of the founding professors of the Royal College of Music, where he taught composition for the rest of his life. While he composed many symphonies, concertos, chamber music, Stanford is mostly known today for his extraordinary contribution to British church music. At an early age, he had developed a profound love of traditional melody, which remained a vital source of creativity throughout his life. Irish folk songs informed much of his own melodic talents, but more than that, it engendered in him a predisposition for simplicity and a desire for economy, and this simplicity brings to get together content and form when it comes to the underlying spirituality of Gaelic music.
For our next and second hymn, we'll come back to the text of St. Patrick's Breastplate, which we started with, though a different part of the prayer. This one starts with, I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. This metaphor of binding, which begins most of the verses of the song, evokes the strapping on of protective armor with that military theme we already looked at earlier. It became a popular Victorian hymn after it was translated into English by Cecil Francis Alexander in 1889. It's usually sung to the tune of St. Patrick from the book Irish Music, as noted by George Petrie and edited by the composer Stanford in 1903. There are many legends around about St. Patrick. One of them credits Patrick with teaching the Irish about the doctrine of the Holy Trinity by showing people the shamrock, a three-leaf plant, using it to illustrate the Christian teaching of three persons into one God. Another one tells of Patrick banishing all snakes into the sea after they attacked him during a 40-day fast he was undertaking on top of a hill. Oh, finally, my favorite one. During his journey back to Ireland from his parents' home, Patrick is understood to have carried with him an ash walking stick or staff. He thrust this stick into the ground wherever he preached. And there's a place where his message took so long to get through to the people that the stick had apparently taken root by the time he was ready to move on. And that place is now called Aspatria, Ash of Patrick. There are many heroic legends, but he is remembered mostly for the prayer of St. Patrick's, which is a staple of Christian spirituality ever since then. So we remain seated as the voices stand and lead, I bind unto myself today.
Thank you for joining us today. There will be an opportunity at the end to donate to a retiring collection as you go out in cash, or if you prefer different ways of giving, you can see those on the back of your sheets. Do join us for Great Sacred Music next Thursday at 1 p.m. Details on the back of your sheet. And if you can't join us each week, you can find Great Sacred Music online on our Facebook page or on St. Martin's Digital 24 hours later on Fridays at 1 p.m. And if you enjoy today's type of service, do also join us each Sunday at 3.15 for Choral Classics, or sister program led by members of St. Martin's Voices. We finish today with a third piece from Stanford's six Irish folk songs, O Sight Entrancing, written by Thomas More and published in volume eight of his Irish Melodies. Thank you. 